tonight as we celebrate the publication of this beautiful book, Looking Again. This is the first publication um, devoted to no one's collection of photography since 1979, uh, well before many of the people in this room were born, which is <laughs> shocking to think about. Um, since that time, the collection has grown in extraordinary ways, certainly in number. Um, it has grown to over 14,000 images, um, and that is a truly remarkable achievement, which is due to the efforts of many, many people, many of whom are here tonight. Um, and the collection spans the entire history of photography, from the 1840s to the, to the present day. Um, all of you know Russell uh, Lord, our Noma Freeman family curator of photographs. And he has done extraordinary work in the creation of this volume, as well as in his curatorial work here at Noma. Um, he's made a very careful and thoughtful selection of 131 images for the book out of 14,000. That is a remarkable selection, truly a curated selection. Um, and each in their own right is an important work of art, but also stands for a moment um, in history, a moment in art history and in the history of photography. Um, in addition to these beautiful images, he has written very thoughtful, um, almost meditative text uh, that accompanies each image. And uh, each is a very eloquent exposition on uh, the artist, or the moment of its creation, the context, the concept behind the work. Um, and I encourage you to spend equal time with the text as the image, if that's not blasphemous in this context, in this room. Um, so as with any project, uh, Russell, of course, is the lead, but this is uh, the work of many, many people. And I'm delighted to see that so many of you who have contributed in meaningful ways um, to our collection are here tonight. Uh, we are truly grateful to all of the donors, uh, those of you who have given the precious objects that you yourself have collected, um, those of you who have given funds so that we can collect objects that we think are important uh, to the collection, uh, those who have supported exhibitions and programs that have advanced um, our presentation of photography, and also all of you who form our audience. Um, it is truly important that we hear from you. Your praise is always appreciated, but so is critique, uh, comment. All of those things have fed into this very rich stream that has ultimately resulted in this publication and in Russell's good work um, here. Uh, I also just want to pause for a moment. Unfortunately, um, John Bullard couldn't be here tonight, but he, if he were here, he would all raise a glass. Uh, to him and to his precious in deciding in 1973, the year after he arrived at this institution, to begin the creation of a collection of photography and to foster and nurture a collection, uh, an environment that supports um, that collection here at NOMA. It was an extraordinary um, moment uh, for this museum, but also for museums throughout the United States. This was not uh, the usual path for uh, any museum in the country at that time. And in addition, John not only began the collection, but he established the institutional framework to support a curator of photography. And that is, I think, equally important. We have had six remarkable shepherds and shapers of this collection, um, Russell being the sixth. And um, without that institutional support, uh, the collection would not be what it is today. So we are very grateful to John. When you see him, please uh, thank him. <laughs> so. Um, so of course, tonight's main event uh, is Russell's talk, and it is truly my pleasure um, to introduce him or be the preamble to his presentation. Um, he joined our staff uh, seven years ago, and is our first true historian of uh, photography. And I think all of us have witnessed just the remarkable growth um, of the depth and richness of our uh, 
presentations and the installations and publications under Russell's stewardship. He is an extraordinary colleague, and I could not be happier <laughs> to be celebrating this remarkable achievement with all of you tonight. So please join me in welcoming Russell Ford. Thank you all, and thank you, Lisa. Uh, it's been such a, a pleasure uh, to be able to work with you over these past seven years, and this book would not exist without your guidance and your assistance along the way, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, I also have to thank a few other people who helped, uh, who helped make the book that we're celebrating tonight. First, I'd like to thank some of my colleagues here at the institution who worked on various parts of its production. Uh, Romana Loken, Seth Boonchai, Mary Page Phelps, and Laura Povinelli all did various things, including rights and reproductions and the wonderful photography of the photographs that you see in the book. Uh, second, I'd like to acknowledge the people who uh, supported the book financially. Kitty and Stephen Sherrill, A.D. Heavey, Dominic Russo, uh, the late Dr. Russell Albright, Tina Freeman and Philip Willem, Joshua Mann Paylette, Josephine Sacrebo, and Alexandra Stafford. John Abasian and Scott Simmons, John Bullard, of course, and Millie and George Deneg, A.L. Jung III, Sherry and Jim Pierce, and uh, I'm perhaps most excited to, to say the New Orleans Photo Alliance, where a number of you are here today, and we're really grateful for your support as an organization. I also want to thank the publisher, Aperture, for, uh, for co-publishing this book with Noma, and in particular, Amelia Lang, for her support in the final stages of the book. Uh, and finally, to, to my wife, Dana Gruber, and our children, Eleanor and Noah, who are here tonight, uh, for holding it all together during what was often an all-consuming process. A hundred years ago today, this museum presented its first photography exhibition, but it would take another 60 years before the museum began building its own photography collection. When it did start collecting photography in 1973, this was still before most museums in this country took photography seriously. As a result, with very little competition and modest means, the New Orleans Museum of Art was able to build one of the finest collections of photography in this country that today contains many masterworks that any museum would be lucky to have. The book we are celebrating tonight, Looking Again, Photography at the New Orleans Museum of Art, takes a close look at this collection and this institution's history of photography. I also dare say that it functions as a history or histories of photography, providing insight into the many ways in which photography has been used or perhaps even misused throughout history. Indeed, the title, Looking Again, is meant to provoke the reader to dig a little deeper, to consider not only the image we see, but what might be behind its making and how and why it has been used throughout history. In the selection of 131 photographs in the book, I have tried to echo the strengths and be honest about the weaknesses of the collection. For example, it will be apparent that the museum boasts a rich collection of European and American photographs, but a very limited representation of works from other regions of the world or even from diverse cultural perspectives within the United States. Thanks in part to the process of putting this book together, there are, these are absences that we are actively trying to fill as we continue to build the collection. Tonight, I'd like to tell four different stories based on images in the book that I think embody the need for us to look and then look again when we're considering photographs. And we'll begin with what I hope is a very recognizable image, Lewis Hines' Mechanic and Steam Pump from 1920. This is perhaps one of the most famous photographs ever made and certainly the most famous to be included in this particular book. Or is it? What I hope to demonstrate here is that calling a single photograph an icon can be a complicated affair, especially since modern photography affords us the chance to take repeated shots of the same scene. It is true that some great photographs are the product of circumstance. The right time of day, the right gestures, and the right vantage point, for example, collapse into a single moment that a photographer is lucky enough to witness. Other photographs, even those that masquerade as documents, like, for example, this one, are actually the result of persistence, lengthy experimentation, and the concerted imposition of the photographer's will. Hines' image here is an example of the latter. Over the course of a photography session with mechanics of the Pennsylvania Railroad, Hines produced several negatives of different men posing with different machines before he apparently settled on the handsome, powerful model in the famous image. 
Even then, however, Pine made slight adjustments to the choice of the model and to the final mechanics pose and the camera's position. One of the pictures was tossed out, the one on the right here, uh, because the mechanics fly was open during the exposure. <laughs> The result is a series of variants, some of which are so similar that they have often been used interchangeably as, quote, the iconic image, which is exactly what I've done here. The one in our collection, the one seen on the left, is not the one that was most often chosen by Hein for reproduction. In his favorite, on the right, the mechanic's arms are slightly more extended and his head leans further forward. And yet, they could easily be mistaken for each other. The artifice of both images is apparent. The wrench's grip on the bolt is poorly suited to the task of tightening. But as representations of power making, the pictures are unparalleled, with arms echoing spokes and muscles bolts. Since both the pictures achieve Hein's goal of championing the symbiotic relationship between man and machine, positioning the modern worker as an essential and forceful wrangler of industrial production, perhaps there need not be only one iconic image. Hein first published the other variant uh, in Power Makers, Work Portraits by Lewis Hein, an article in which he equated the role of the railroad workers with that of ancient horse groomers and caretakers, responsible for the harnessing of, quote, 10,000 horsepower, end quote. Since then, one of these two versions of the image has been widely published and even imitated or altered in images circulating on the internet. For example, it has been used on stamps in the US and of all places, Palau, and has even been imitated in a Lego tableau. <laughs> and that's, I think, when you know you've, you've hit it big time, Lego imitates you. What's interesting to me is that all of the ones that, uh, that appear on the stamp and the ones that most often circulate on the internet are of our image, which was not the one that apparently Hein tried to make famous. So it's a slight variant, so it shows how interchangeable they've become. At any rate, the mutation from a singular image to a series of images demonstrates how photography is often more strongly tethered to an idea than it is to a particular moment in time. Hein was an active proponent of this argument, referring to his practice as, quote, interpretive photography in stamped credits on the backs of his prints. I've always found this a kind of peculiar uh, statement for somebody who's so well known for documenting social conditions. We refer to it as interpretive. His understanding of photography's conceptual possibilities allowed him to create multiple successful photographs in this project that today form an iconic collective, a series of closely related images that enter our consciousness as powerful illustrations of an idea that Hein meticulously crafted into pictures. For our next case, we'll take a look at this beautiful photograph and the history that it suffered subsequent to its making. This is by Carolyn Haskins Gurry. Who, moved, who arrived in Hawaii in 1901 to work for a portrait photography studio, but was soon operating her own. In what is now her best known body of work, she produced a series of 50 large, softly focused pictorial portraits of children, including this one here. The images' ethereal qualities and softly modeled volumes, as well as the subject's often wistful expressions, would at first suggest that these portraits were made exclusively for aesthetic reasons as fine art photographs that celebrated the individuality of each sitter. However, in many of the other images from the series, Gurry draws attention to the hybrid ethnicity of each child, titling her images Indian Hawaiian, Irish Hawaiian, and Japanese Hawaiian, etc., which reveals the photograph's other documentary role. The result is a complex set of pictures of children of mixed parentage that pits aesthetics against information and that engages contemporary pictorialist practice with a long tradition of ethnographic portraiture. In this sense, these pictures are akin to the work of photographers like Poteau and Rousseau, who are also represented in the catalog, but not by this pair of photographs. They were 19th century ethnographic photographers who were charged with creating a catalog of human types for the Musée de l'Homme, or the Museum of Man, in Paris. Indeed, like Poteau and Rousseau, Gurry actually photographed many of her subjects, too, twice frontally and in profile. These pairs highlight the somewhat uncomfortable and even contradictory marriage of pictorial practice with ethnographic portraiture. The soft focus seems to efface information, and the carefully contrived poses of the figures emphasize psychology over sociology, as if the child's individual identity struggles to shrug off the generic mantle of racial typing. Gurry claimed to have made these pictures to celebrate the diversity of Hawaii's eth ethnic composition, and she considered it beautiful, but regardless of her original intention, these pictures would find their way into highly conflicted and problematic places. 
In 1909, all 50 were exhibited at the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exhibition in Seattle, whose express purpose was to promote the exploitation of that territory's resources, including Hawaii. The photographs were displayed in the ethnographic section of the show, where visitors were served pineapple, and I'm, this is true, by attractive young Hawaiian girls. And in 1921, uh, perhaps even more strangely, they were exhibited at the Second Eugenics Congress in Philadelphia at the American Natural History Museum. There, they were exhibited alongside the 19th century composite images of Francis Galton, the controversial social scientist who coined the term eugenics to describe the dangerous belief that human genetics could be controlled and refined through breeding. And here we're looking at a page from, uh, a photographic page from the book that he coined the term eugenics in. And he invented this kind of photography called composite photography, which involved taking photographs of, you can see here, for example, under the disease column, six and 19 different people with the same disease. And then he would superimpose all of those negatives and print them together, thereby creating a portrait of disease, if you will. So the belief was that if you, photographed enough people, only their shared physiognomic traits uh, would appear in the final image, and you would have a portrait that represented that. Of course, this is troubling because it, it believes that some internal moral or mental character is due to physiognomic traits. Um, and this was an argument that was taken up by the Nazis, but this is uh, the kind of picture that, that um, poor Carolyn Gurry was exhibited next to. This story stands as a stark reminder of the afterlife of a photograph and the malleability of its meaning. A photograph, once severed from its original context, takes on a life of its own and can often be submitted as evidence for several different arguments, regardless of its maker's original intentions. Our third case looks at this incredible portrait by Margaret Bork White, who is often best known as the first woman war correspondent and the first woman to work for Life magazine. Her photograph, for example, of the Fort Peck Dam appeared on the cover of the very first Life magazine issue in 1936. Uh, and just as a brief aside, um, Margaret Bork White is one of my favorite people in the history of photography. I wish I could have met her at some point. She, um, we did a solo show of her work in 1934 here at, at, at the New Orleans Museum of Art before she was even on the cover of Life magazine. Um, and she, she was born and raised in Cleveland and so we reached out to the Cleveland Museum of Art to get her address, and by that time she had had quite a bit of success and she was living in a fairly famous location. And so the Cleveland Museum telegrammed back to us and said, just, uh, just write it to Miss Margaret Bork White, the Chrysler Building, New York City, and it'll get to her. So um, at that point she had moved uh, her studio to the Chrysler Building. She'd actually been hired to photograph the building of the, the construction of the Chrysler Building. And she fell in love with the building so much that she wanted to live there. And she asked the developers and they said, it's purely commercial. Uh, there's nobody lives, lives in the building. The only person that lives in the building is the janitor. And so she applied to be the janitor. But the job was already filled. So she settled for an amazing studio on the 66th floor, which was the floor with the gargoyles. And she apparently quite frequently would crawl out onto the gargoyles to take these pictures of, uh, of the New York skyline. So for those familiar with her work on war, one might easily mistake this picture for a wartime portrait, perhaps a soldier with a gas mask on. But in fact, it's actually a powerful portrait of American labor produced as part of a project documenting the working processes and conditions of the Aluminum Company of America. Lewis Klinkscales, as Bork White explains in a pencil inscription on the back of our print, was a shakeout man responsible for knocking the castings out of the sand molds just after the molten metal had cooled and solidified. The sweat beating on his brow and the fogged and dust-covered goggles and the respirator mask make plain the intensity of the heat and the inherent danger of the work. The Aluminum Company of America was a powerful company in the 1930s. In fact, in 1937, Life magazine published a brief article about an antitrust suit that aimed to dissolve that company. The article was accompanied by another Bork White photograph of the, quote, operating heads of the company. The fact that she had access to both the boardroom and the foundry floor is remarkable in its own right. But the difference between the two photographs is a lesson in industrial labor divisions. In the boardroom portrait, several suited men engrossed in conversation sit on leather couches and chairs and their freshly shined shoes sparkle in the light. The mark of hard labor is nowhere to be seen. 
In the portrait of Klingscales, however, nothing is fresh or clean, and yet he remains unflinching in front of the camera. Bork White, who photographed both war and industry, here presents a protagonist who could exist in either sphere. As I mentioned, at a glance, the respirator and goggles look much like the apparatus of chemical warfare, and the tight frame monumentalizes clink scales. It is a heroic image, but with portentous overtones, as if the already tense relationship between labor and management could soon become something worse. Our final case takes us to Bamako, the capital city of Mali. In 1960, the Republic of Mali declared its independence from the French colonial rule that extended back to the late 19th century. Eager to erase the trappings of Western European influence, leaders of the new republic sought to establish a particularly African style of political, social, and cultural policies. Many young Malians, however, viewed independence as a chance to celebrate their newfound personal freedom, and freedom for them meant the chance to participate in a universal youth movement. The staunch African philosophy of many Malian leaders was therefore at odds with the younger generation's desire to import the music, clothing, and attitudes of Western culture. In Bamako, young people began to search for a new form of visual representation. Staid studio portraiture with its roots in static 19th century images of wealth and power was rejected as conservative and artificial. Instead, they wanted pictures that matched the dynamic, vibrant energy of, this, of the culture they were importing. This desire led them to seek out mobile, engaged photographers who could depict them as autonomous, joyful, and independent. They found the perfect accomplice in Malik Sidibe. Although in-studio portraits were his primary business, Sidibe, as early as 1957, had begun photographing private events in and around Bamako. Ultimately, he became a permanent fixture in the social clubs, or greens, that formed in the city. The greens, which all had names like the Beatles, Les Monkeys, Las Vegas, and so on, after their music idols or cultural phenomena from the Western world, would serve as meeting places to discuss current social topics of Western and African culture. Using a small camera, CDB captured the conversations, the drinking, and the dancing, and photographed impromptu portraits of people in their finest Western-style attire. After the gathering, he would spend most of the night making small proofs for the party attendees to look at the next day. These small proof work prints were then mounted to supports, which are essentially manila folders, and numbered so that customers could choose which images to purchase. That's actually what we're looking at here. Um, the energy, confidence, and camaraderie of the various greens unfold through these series of small and often sequential photographs. This sheet of prints, labeled Les Copains, the friends, shows four dapper young men either posing individually with mock seriousness in front of a stark white wall or smiling and dancing with friends in later images. So these are actually quite rare for a museum to have. Uh, CD Bay, these are the things that still lived in CD Bay's studio when, uh, up until his death uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, but these were given to us by another fairly well-known artist, Philip Taff, who had visited CD Bay, and CD Bay gave him 11 of these uh, sheets with these contact prints, so we have 11 in the collection. For a few decades, these small prints and the small 8x10 prints that he would make for his clients were all that existed of CD Bay's artwork. In 1995, however, his work was introduced to a much larger art world uh, audience when it was selected for an exhibition in Paris. Since then, professional printers have made huge prints from his negatives, with his approval, for exhibitions in museums and commercial galleries. These enlargements draw upon the graphic sensibilities of the original, the patterned clothing and textured surfaces, but they explode them to enormous proportions. As a result, the intimacy, the context of independence, and the cultural shift implicit in the originals are cast aside in favor of the picture's formal qualities. In effect, the pictures have been transformed from document to art, removed from the administrative folders of his studio and the family albums of the participants, and launched with great gusto onto the walls of fine art institutions. Despite this slippage from socio-cultural artifact to fine art, Sidibe was very approving of the transformation. As he once said, quote, you can't imagine what it was like for me the first time I saw prints of my negatives printed large scale, no spots, clean and perfect, that's when I knew that my work was really, really good. <laughs> These are only a few cases among the many wonderful and fascinating works featured in the book. So before I conclude, I just want to quickly give you a sense of the scope covered in the book and a little bit about its, its layout and format. The dates of the photographs cover almost a complete history of photography, with the oldest being this picture on the left by William Henry Fox Talbot, one of the inventors of photography, 
Uh, this is from 1843 in Paris, and I, I love this picture. It's an amazing print. Uh, and you can see that he's, he's taken this from a window of his hotel room, which is all he could do because at this point there are no tripods. You are looking for a windowsill to put your big box camera. And he knew that that little light post was in the middle of the bottom of the frame, and he took the picture anyway because that's life, and that's what photography is. Um, and then the oldest picture, the most recent picture in, in the book, is this uh, Debbie Fleming Caffrey work from 1985, an artist who has lived and worked in Louisiana all her life. And this is a picture of uh, two people who work on a sugar plantation that she's known for a long time, Homer and Roland. Uh, and they're, they're looking at the burning of the, the sugarcane field. So it's actually daytime, but she is turning day into night with this, with this picture. The selection also includes fantastic images that were created as advertisements. Here we have a, a Maholi Naj uh, from 1927, which is actually an advertisement for the Shokin department store. Uh, Maholi Naj, some of you might know, was a, a famous professor and a great artist uh, at the Bauhaus. Uh, and taught design, but this is how he put his design to use. He very much believed that design should be everywhere, even in advertising pages and magazines. Uh, that's also true of this incredibly beautiful uh, work by Ilsa Bing, which shows some evidence of darkroom trickery in the upper left. The tones are starting to revert back to a negative. That We, we call that solarization. But this is an advertisement that she made for uh, a scent by Elsa Schiaparelli called Salou. And it also feels quite funereal but it's, it's an allegory of smell. This, if you're going to make a picture about a scent, this is how you do it. Um, the selection also includes examples of negatives. Here, a really beautiful paper negative from the 19th century. Uh, the first negatives in photography were made out of paper and they are magical objects and they practically glow from within. Um, and it includes unique daguerreotypes, the very first photographic process introduced to the world. Uh, this is a daguerreotype, very likely of a free person of color, uh, but we know for sure that it was made by Felix Moissanet here in New Orleans in the 1850s at number one Camp Street on the corner of Canal in a skylight uh, studio, as they all would have been, because of course photography requires light and there are no electric lights at this point, so all the studios were on these greenhouse looking contraptions on the top floors of buildings and cities. And the book sequence is set up in such a way that hopefully it will invite comparison between juxtaposing images. Uh, I've envisioned a relationship between many of the pictures in the book, but I hope that you all will find others as you flip between the pages. Here, for example, uh, these appear right after each other um, in the book. Uh, two interiors that both look very austere, but one is out of necessity. On the left, we have Jacob Reese's photograph of a very poor lodging house, although not the poorest. This is Bunks in a seven cent lodging house and there were one cent lodging houses that had less uh, luxurious accommodations. And then on the right, uh, a picture by Vilmos Hujar of a high design room by Gerrit Rietveld, the famous Dutch de Stiel uh, designer. So uh, two, in, a black, in black and white photographs, all the color that would have been in that Gerrit Rietveld interior just disappears, um, and you're left with nothing but austerity. Uh, so two very different pictures, but um, but ones that can be compared together in the book. And sometimes the book makes uh, arguments about photographic style, showing you how different an approach can be to essentially the same subject. So here we have Edward Weston and Clarence John Lachlan tackling different plantations, but also with very different goals. Uh, Weston liked to impose order wherever he went, and Lachlan seemed to enjoy the chaos, the messiness, the detritus, the crumbling ruins uh, of the plantations around Louisiana. And finally, I'll conclude uh, with a shameless plug for our next exhibition. Um, this is a wonderful photograph by Lee Friedlander in the book. Uh, we already have a group of Lee Friedlander's color photographs of American musicians uh, behind you in the Great Hall on display. They will be joined uh, in a month by a larger show upstairs of all of the work that he's done in Louisiana over the past 60 years. Uh, he started coming here in 1957 as an employee of Atlantic Records to make portraits for album covers and he's been coming every year since. So he's lived in New York his whole life, but this is a second home for him. Uh, and he's really kind of perfected his, um, his artful documentary style of street photography here in New Orleans. Uh, so there will be some real treasures in that show. This, one of his most famous pictures, was actually on the cover of a catalog for a show that he had at MoMA back in the 1970s. And uh, it shows him, it's a self-portrait, shows him photographing himself in a shop window, and at the very back of the shop, 
was a mirror. So you actually get his reflection twice, that tiny little square in the middle of the picture uh, with his image on it. So this is a picture made possible only by photography, which collapses all of those planes into one visual plane. You can't stand there and see this picture. If you do, if you're standing there, we can choose to look at the window or through the window, but we can't do both at the same time. And that's a magical thing. There's so many more, but I wrote this book so that it can exist in your hands and you can all dig deeper, hopefully during many more moments at home. And as Lisa said, you all are the audience for this book. And this collection is in many ways your collection too. So I hope that you will bring this book into the world and share this important collection with others. Thank you very much. Thank you.